There's the gun. Owens is in lane six. This is the 220 low hurdles, and Jesse Owens, the Buckeye bullet, is favored to win this event. Owens, who has already broken two world marks in these 1935 NCAA championships, is running over the field. There he goes, he's flying. And this Berkeley, California crowd has seen quite a track display this afternoon from the Ohio State star, Jesse Owens. In the early 30s, the seed of a legend begins to flash down the gritty cinder tracks of Cleveland, Ohio. Jesse Owen sets a scholastic record in the 100-yard dash that stands for 30 years. Wins more individual Big Ten track titles than anyone in the history of the conference. Three world records and ties another in a single meet for the greatest one-day performance the sport has ever witnessed. Four gold medals, 1936 Olympic Games, Berlin, Germany. Today, Owens is a public relations executive in Phoenix, Arizona. Former Green Bay great Paul Horning met with Owens at a grammar school during one of Owens' frequent speaking engagements, and then later at Horning's Manhattan apartment, where they explored the legend of a man who became an American folk hero. form of precision is coming from Mercury. The new precision size marquee. It's the USA Cable Network rolls out bowling's best in the Kessler Classic. Don't miss a frame of the PBA on USA at 8 p.m. Eastern Thursday. Jesse, uh, your name is synonymous, of course, with the 1936 Olympics, but you actually uh, startled the world of track and field even in high school. Well, Paul, it all began really in junior high school by meeting a man that was known at that time as the world's fastest human being, and that was the beginning of a dream. When I went to high school, and of course my senior year, we were at the last national interscholastic meet in Chicago. And there I was able to tie the world's record for the 100-yard dash, which was 9-4, to, to create a new world's record for high schools. We also set a record in that meet of 20 and 7 tenths for high schools in the 220-yard dash. And just a week prior to that, uh, we had set a new world's record in the running broad jump, uh, 24 feet, 11 and 3 quarters of an inch. And that was the beginning. On to Ohio State and one of the greatest days that I guess track and field has ever seen. That was at a Ann Arbor. It was a very happy day in my life. Uh, on that day, why we were able to tie the world's record in the 100 at 9-4. We set records in the 220-yard dash and then the 220 low hurdles. And then we took one broad jump and uh, we set a record there that stood for some 25 years. And you were a sophomore at Ohio State. This was what, the Big Ten Finals? Uh, this was the Big Ten Finals. It was my first Big Ten meet. I was a sophomore at the time. Jesse, let's take a look at that great performance in the 1935 Big Ten Finals. All right. Here I am in lane number two. This is coming down for the first, uh, the final heat of the 100 uh, yard dash and forced enough to be able to tie the record at nine and four tenths on that particular day. And you broke three other world records that day. And this is the second. This is the running broad jump. One jump we took. We went past the handkerchief mark there to create a record of 26 feet, eight and a quarter inches. Now this is very interesting. Being on the inside in the hurdles, and, uh, of course, it's very difficult because you've got the, uh, the wall to contend with. And this is the finals at, uh, I would say that this here in lane number one is the finals at the National NC2A at Berkeley, California. And this is the 220 at Berkeley, California. And, of course, it was very fortunate to have lane number three here, having an idea to watch the other fellows on the other side. And as you come down, Sometimes you feel as though you're and as you get to this last hurdle as you come down here then you find yourself going and straining because that last hurdle looks like it's about 10 feet tall and that's where you have the advantage going over that last one. Well those records that you uh, set at Ann Arbor they stood for 25 and 30 years. Well uh, the, the running broad jump record stood uh, for 25 years. Uh, the 220 stood for 18 years, mm -hmm. and uh, and of course one of my favorite races 
at all times was the 220 low hurdles. Now this is a tough one and uh, Glenn Harden was giving me a pretty rough time in that particular race as we came to the finish line. This is where we took a jump, jumped 26 feet two and one half inches. And this of course is the finals. And uh, these are the finals here at Berkeley, California. Mm -hmm. A little Ford Draper up here was one of the toughest competitors that you might find in that hundred, uh, in that hundred yards. The pen relays. Well, this is the hundred meters in the pen relays uh, with six of us in it. And Eunice Peacock pulled a muscle and I was very fortunate. The fellow with the M is from Michigan University and one of my tough competitors down through the years. And we were able to win that particular race and win a gold watch at the pen relays. Broad this jump. is a broad jump at the pen relays where we were able to win it. Now this is the final of the 100 meters at Randall's Island in 1936. That's Mike Robinson, Jackie Robinson's brother that finished second. Now here's one of the greatest broad jumpers of all time, Ralph Boston. And it was my good fortune at the Garden that night to present him with the trophy as the outstanding athlete of that particular uh, meet. So again, Madison Square Garden. Now, here is a great thrill in my life. He was a young fellow. He was about 18 years old. Uh, John Thomas, one of the greatest high jumpers of all times. The first person to ever go seven feet. And this is it. 19,000 people were really thrilled that night because of his sterling performance of going over seven feet in the high jump. And this is a tense moment where you're measuring it to see whether or not it's going to be official mm. jump. And you can see the joy that he has on yep. his face. And of course, his teammates were quite thrilled with the things that he did. Many years of practice went into that, just that one jump. Surprising thing about it, Paul, that's uh, a lot of people don't realize. Yeah, they, th they look at the finished product, the night of the finals but it's the day in and day out effort, getting the leg over properly, the steps properly, and then discipline yourself into the training procedures. These are the things that make for a Saturday night a thrill for the people that sit in the stands. Jesse, you've helped so many people in track and field, and not only in track and field, you've been connected for years now with the youth of America. So you've traveled all over the United States as far as public relations are concerned for many and you meet with many, many youth groups. What important message are you trying to convey? Well, Paul, if I'm talking to youngsters, say for instance, uh, from kindergarten up to the sixth or seventh grade, uh, you try to talk to them about the home in which they live. You try to compare it to a football game or a baseball game or a team sport in which they know something about. How many of you play football? All right. How many of you play basketball? How many, do you, how many of you swim? Great. Now we all know and we all play on team sports, right? Football is a game that takes 11 men to play, right? Now each one of you that play on that football team, fellas, you have a position to play, don't you? And each position carries a responsibility, right? All right, now, you got a quarterback. You got a couple of ends. You've got a couple of guards, and then you've got backfield men. And every person has a responsibility in that particular position in which he plays. Now, if every man on that football team fulfills his responsibility when the quarterback calls the play, then you either have a long run or you have a touchdown. Now, if we take it in baseball, it's the same principle. In basketball, it's the same principle. But now let's talk about the home from which we come. And let's take our home and let's make it a team. Because you are a member of that home from which you come, right? You have a, a room in that house and you have responsibilities in that room in which you have. Then you have responsibilities as far as mom and dad is concerned. And your mom and dad is the quarterback of your home team. You close with them in reference to their home, what their responsibilities are in the home as a member of the team. In reference to the two quarterbacks within that home, their mom and their dad, and what their responsibilities are. 
And each member, if each member of that family fulfills his responsibility, when the quarterback calls the play, such as the dad, making the economic factors to make that home work, the mother providing the love and the understanding and cooking of the meals, and the child taking care of his room, obeying thy mother and thy father, then to me, this is a team. You don't have a long run there, like you do in football or a touchdown, but you have love and you have a feeling of belonging, you have a feeling of need, and most of all, you have togetherness. Recently, uh, the NC2A gave you the highest award it could give when you received the Roosevelt Award in San Francisco. A great well, award. to us, that's the, is like you, to the Football Hall of Fame or the Baseball Hall of Fame. And in the collegiate circles, that's the Hall of Fame. Be chosen by your peers after a number of years that you have finished your particular field of endeavor. And they feel that you've made a contribution. Ladies and gentlemen, because I love you all, that as you leave here and you go back to the home from which you have come, my prayer is, whether you're riding or whether you're walking, may God ride with you, may he walk with you, and may he continue to give you the guidance and understanding for the privilege that we have to live upon his earth. And as he looks from above to us, his children below, we of the NCAA can look back and say, yes, oh God, through men that we have had today, we will make this a better world and a better place for mankind to live. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Your name, the name of Jesse Owens, is one of the greats, if not the greatest name in the history of American track and field. You were present at the 1968 Olympics at Mexico City. What did the demonstrations mean to you as a black man? You were present. You must have known the kids. I knew the kids well. You know, this is one thing I like about this America. Unlike any other country in the world, you have the privilege to speak out. But I felt, uh, as a black American, I live in a land, yes, that is not perfect by any means. I don't think there's any perfect place in the world. The only per perfect place that I know is the heaven in which we hope that we all might go. But while we live here on this earth, of the Constitution of this country, I feel that every uh, citizen is entitled to what the Constitution says. But on the other hand, I think that there is a way to express dissatisfaction. And I can almost liken it to wars. Paul, you fight battles on battlefields. And Mexico City was the wrong battlefield on which to express and to fight the battle that belong to the continental borders of this nation in which we live. I feel that we have people here that are bringing forth the injustices of our country to certain peoples of this land. Not only the black, the Indian, the Mexican-American, but I do believe that there's a way, and there's a time, and there's a place to express that. And I thought that Mexico City was the wrong battlefield on which to fight that battle. Speaking of battlefields, in 1936, you win the greatest battle any American could hope to win. The year 36, the scene, the Olympics in Berlin. And we're going to go back to those great moments in that 36 Olympics in just a moment. Thank you. And now, this is the beginning of six of the greatest days of my life. This was the opening ceremonies for the German youth, and this was where they were told that the Olympic Games was a great thing to them, and that this was the beginning of the Aaron supremacy, that uh, they could conquer the world as far as athletics were concerned. And of course, these great rallies were held, and of course, this is the Olympic Stadium. And on that day, the opening ceremonies is where Hitler is coming down now, to go to his box uh, to begin the opening of the Olympic Games.
this is our contingent. And uh, one strange thing is that every nation dipped their flag, but uh, as they passed the reviewing stand. But America has never dipped its flag, and of course, the people felt a little amiss about it, but this was our way of doing it. When Hitler uh, would not shake hands, did you realize how important point in history that would be as far as American sport is concerned? Well, no, Paul, we didn't begin to realize it then. We didn't know the political implications at that time because it wasn't our concern. We were only concerned with the idea of being there to be able to represent our nation in those Olympic Games. We could see the brown shirts and we could see the many flags. And uh, we did not think in terms of the implications that it might lead to in later years. And here is Hitler as he is now giving the Olympic oath, and, uh, which is the privilege of the heads of every government to do so. This young man was chosen and the last runner now as he takes his turn around this 400 meters. And he's going to go up the stairway where the torch that will burn throughout the entire length of the games itself. And when this torch is lit, the pledge is made by all athletes. And this is now one of the heats in the 100 meters. And this is where, and I, I don't say this uh, braggadociously, but this was the beginning when we won the applause of the people. Mm -hmm. Here is another heat. Frank Wyckoff from Southern California is here. Ralph Metcalf, and this is the finals. And I beat Ralph Metcalf by just a mere yard in that 100 meters, which was the first uh, gold medal that I had won in the Olympic Games. It was the culmination to all your dreams when you stood on that platform. Well, you know, you can stand there on that day, Paul, and as you look at your flag rise above all others, and you can say to yourself, today I am an Olympic champion. And of course, when we begin to look at the high jump here, and these are two important characters there. This is the winner. This is a Southern California boy, boy by the name of Cornelius Johnson from Compton Junior College, which was the Olympic champion. And he was the first gold medal winner and the first black. And uh, when you're talking about snubs, of course, he was the first black that Hitler snubbed in the Olympic Games itself. And this is where three Finns finish one, two, three, which is most unusual. And this is the day when Hitler came down on the field and uh, to congratulate one of their German winners, but he also shook hands with the three boys from Friendly. Now this is a very interesting race here. This is Glenn Harden from the United States, from LSU. Glenn Harden won the 400 meter hurdles in 53.2. Interesting thing, his son in the 1964 Olympic Games he placed third, but ran better times than his dad. This is the final jump. And the uh, long jump, and the first one to congratulate me was a boy by the name of Lutz Long that placed second, which later developed to be one of the better friends that I had uh, made during those Olympic Games. You won four gold medals and, in this Olympics. And the course of the four gold medals. This is Helen Stevens. She is known as the world's fastest woman at that time. And she won two gold medals. She won the 100 meters and of course the women were victorious in the 400 meter relay. And this is a great moment to stand atop the victory stand with some hundred odd thousand people looking on. And one of the thrilling races to me of the 36 games was Johnny Woodruff from uh, Connellsburg, Pennsylvania, went to the University of Pitt, and he ran completely on the outside to set a new Olympic record in winning the 800 meters. Uh, Long John, we call him, and uh, of course to stand there with the flags and all of those things, it's a great day. Great and reception. Yeah, well, this is a great reception. Two great men, Bill Robinson, one of the greatest fighters of all time, Jack Dempsey, and the greatest gal in the world, my wife. And on this day, as I stood between those men, 
and the crowd, and as I looked down, was able to kiss my wife. That was the end of the perfect day, and my dream had come true. See Owens, once a track and field superstar, whose flashing feet, pumping arms, and catapulting leap from the takeoff board brought a gasp and a roar from the crowd. When Owens retired from active competition, his scholastic and collegiate performances remained unchallenged for decades. While his four gold medals in the 1936 Berlin Olympics will never be forgotten. Today, Owens volunteers his time for America's youth athletic programs and is a successful public relations executive in Phoenix, Arizona, where he lives with his wife Ruth and their three daughters.